Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. My name is Alessandro Ruggera. I'm the director of the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, and it's my pleasure today to welcome all of you to the second installment of the series Enchanted Museums of Milan. It's a series that we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's uh, a sort of um, continuing uh, um, a series of meetings that we had here in person with the uh, hist historian of art uh, Serena Spinelli. Serena Spinelli is based in Milan and worked uh, in museums and uh, as, a, as a museum tour guide and uh, culture operator. We <clears throat> had her here in, in Toronto for a series of lectures at the Instituto and uh, now that we are facing the restriction due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we, we are not able, although we all hope to have you here again at the Instituto as soon as possible, but at the moment it's impossible for us to organize anything in presence here at the Instituto. We decided together with Serena to organize a series of uh, lectures online, of webinars, um, on the museums in Milan. And the series is called Enchanted Museums. Enchanted, of course, as you can imagine, because of the situation of suspension that has been that created by the by the virus and by the lockdown. Lockdown that is currently <clears throat> uh, not so strict anymore in in Milan. And I was just uh, chatting with uh, with Serena about the situation. And the museum are slowly opening again, but still with a lot of re restrictions and it's still not possible to visit them freely and not, still not possible to have a, a guided tour in the museums. Uh, so we have now this, this opportunity to be guided by, by Serena in another one of the most important and relevant museums in Milan and is the a very sophisticated museums, I would say, and uh, it is it's the Ambrosiana. Is the Biblioteca Ambrosiana. The title of the lecture of today is From Botticelli's Crisis to Leonardo Convictions, four works from the Erudite Ambrosiana collection. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Serena Spinelli and I'm sure you will enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Alessandro, and good evening to you and to uh, everyone. And thank you once again for uh, inviting me. And it's a, a great pleasure for me to be able to join you once again from afar, from Milan. So welcome to the second part of Enchanted Museums. And the theme, as Alessandro was saying, um, has to do with the Ambrosiana collection. And it's a collection which is very, very dear to my heart. Now, the Ambrosiana is a great treasure chest of knowledge and beauty in the center of Milan. And it rests upon a small, solemn piazza of stone, not too far from the Duomo, but tucked away from the crowds and most of the commercial venues. Now, normally we would enter from the front of the building, walk up the few steps and then pushed, push past the very, very heavy glass and wooden doors, find ourselves within a great marble hall bedecked with the plaster casts of the Trojan column. And then we would approach the man behind the mahogany cubicle to inquire about the price of the museum and such. We would glide up another flight of steps, uh, steps which are inhabited by a series of sculptures, paintings, and the most surreal bronze tree. And so the mind would prepare itself for the experience and thus the traditional journey would begin. But we are spirits in all of this, and we can do as we please amongst the enchanted museums. So we shall hover above the roofs, as you can see, for a while, and then dive into the heart of this institution from above. And you can see we have a bird's eye view here. And what you are seeing is one of the secret courtyards of the Ambrosiana. It's a space of great silence and beauty, which has evolved naturally from the ages and from the architectural toil of men. 
And this is a place, believe me, where many stories come together. You can catch a glimpse, I think, on the right-hand side there of a classical building with rows of rounded lodges. Now, beyond that lodge, mosaic rooms await, filled with statues, goddesses, astrolabes, and ivory caskets, who seem to be conversing with the feathered mantles of a shaman or with the natural trinkets of a chamber of wonders. On the left-hand side, you can just about make out that there is a classical, actually a medieval church. You can see the apse of the medieval church there on the left-hand side. And this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it was built by the Milanese Knights of the Crusaders. And here there are ancient bones and ancient echoes that mingle with the sands of Jerusalem. Now in the middle of the courtyard, in the middle is the courtyard, which is referred to as the courtyard of the great souls. And here as spirits, we are bound to find a shoulder to perch on. And it could be the shoulder, as you can see, of Thomas Aquinas, could be the shoulder of Shakespeare, Manzoni, Stendhal, Plato, Paterfi, Paracelsus. You can see there are many statues there. And the idea of creating this meeting of the greats within this courtyard comes from Dante's Divine Comedy. And specifically from one of the chapters of the Inferno where Virgil accompanies Dante through the, through, the, through the author's personal vision of limbo. So this limbo, according, according to Dante, is a place where the souls of great pagans live. They dwell. Here are the non-believers. And they are non-believers non who, in Dante's mind, of course, included um, who in Dante's mind had lived lives of great moral extension. And however, in this bronze comedy within the courtyard of the Ambrosiana, you can see that we also have the Christians. Christians, we have Thomas Aquinas. And so ultimately, this gathering expresses what is a manifestation of Cardinal Federico's, Federico Borromeo's motto, a very important motto, which is called credere e comprendere, which means to believe and to understand. And the two must go hand in hand, according to Cardinal Federico Borromeo. And you can see a portrait of Federico Borromeo on the left-hand side there. Now, he was the founder of this institution, and he came from a very noble Milanese family. And he had been the patron saint of the Academy of St. Luke in uh, Rome, one of the first academies of the arts. And when he conceived of the Ambrosiana, he was Archbishop of Milan. He had succeeded his more famous cousin, St. Charles Borromeo. Now Federico Borromeo was a man of letters. He was a humanist with a very open mind, with a humanist perspective. And he believed that it was possible, therefore, to believe and to understand, to sustain one's faith amidst the exercise of reason in the throes of knowledge and critical thinking. And he had this very curious mind um, the strength of his, faith, of his faith was really enlightened by the Renaissance, which he had absorbed. Now, the historical stronghold of wisdom and beauty, which he shall build, therefore, at the beginning of the 17th century, because we are in the year 1607, when all of this beauty begins, will be conceived as a place of study and as a place of learning 
and it will comprise eventually a picture gallery, a center for research, for research and an academy of the arts. Now this is also where he will build a library like no other. And this library is of great historical importance. And it is of great historical significance because it is in fact the, it was only the second library in Europe to be built along these lines. It was a very particular kind of library. It wasn't exclusive to the prince and the prelates, but it was open to men and women of all walks of life, men and women who of course could read. So it was one of the first public libraries in the world, really. Now, when Federico Borromeo inaugurated, therefore, the Ambrosiana Library, and he did this on a very special date, it was the 8th of December of the year 1609. Now, the 8th of, 8th of December is also the day in Milan in which we celebrate our patron, our patron saint who is St. Ambrose, and therefore the Ambrosiana is dedicated to St. Ambrose. And when he inaugurated this wonderful library, his guests were ushered into this sumptuous space with a very, very high vaulted ceiling. Uh, the vault was originally gilded and colored, and it measured 15 meters from the ground. And today the guests, of this library still find themselves embraced within a kind of uh, wide perimeter of Baroque cabinetry, as you can see. And back then there were 15,000 manuscripts and about 30,000 codexes from all over the world. This was, uh, such were the riches that could be at one's fingertips back then. Today, of course, the holdings of the Ambrosiana have quadrupled, more than quadrupled. And the Ambrosiana holds documents and manuscripts and codexes in the various languages. So in Latin, in Greek, in the Vulgate, in the Arab languages, in Persian, golden tongues of knowledge within a vast cornucopia of subject matter from astronomy to mathematics to theology, from judicial matters to love affairs, from classical literature to the flight of birds. The reading material was carefully catalogued, even back then, even in 1609, and it was made suitable for consultation which was really quite extraordinary for the time. So the bookshelves that you see here, they allowed for a more liberal browsing of the material, as opposed to the old monastic libraries of the time, where certain books and only certain books were chained to the wooden desks and you could only consult those. Now, the Cardinal also made it his, made it his business to ensure that each scholar had access to a quill to ink to paper and to a well-lit fire in the middle of that hole in the winter. Now for the vastness of its collections, the Ambrosiana is undoubtedly one of the most important uh, collections and libraries in the world. And for the purposes of this particular narration and in general as well, I consider the old libraria, libraria is the term that Manzoni will use in a very famous book called The Promessi Sposi, The Betrothed. For the purpose of this narration, the old libraria is one great work of art. I consider it to be the first work of art that I will introduce today. And the other three chosen works will spring, therefore, from this libraria in various ramified ways. Now, among the most outstanding manuscripts that we can find in the Ambrosiana uh, and carefully protected within the caveau beneath the building is this that you see now on your screen, the Ilias Picta. And here 
Athenian soldiers and Trojan soldiers do battle in clashing armor, color to color, body to body, on a millinery parchment made of calves skin made of vellum and this is a millinery parchment that came from Alexandria indeed the whole work was crafted in Alexandria in the fifth fifth century AD so this is a very ancient ancient piece and it's the only illustrated Iliad that has come down to us from the antique world and so it depicts the entirety of Homer's Iliad, including battle scenes and noble scenes. And there are 52 miniatures in total, each labeled numerically. And perhaps, in fact, most probably the authors were many. There were many different authors and many different craftsmen who worked on this precious manuscript. And in fact, they painted the figures first, they painted them nude, and then they added uh, the clothes later on, much like it was done on Greek vase painting. Now, other fifth century AD manuscripts uh, protected by the Ambrosiana would include, uh, for example, fragments of the uh, Vidularia by Plautus. So, the tale of the trunk, the comedy of the renowned Greek author. From this all the way down to a beautiful 15th century manuscript, which you now see on your screen, which is the divine proportion made by Fra Luca Pacioli and Leonardo da Vinci. Now, of divine proportion, such is the title of this uh, work, and it's a compendium of complex geometrical shapes originally discussed by Euclid and here re-elaborated and explained by the mathematician Fra Luca Pacioli, who was also the mathematician of the Sforza court here in Milan at the time. And one of his brightest pupils was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was, of course, also at the court of the uh, absolute ruler, Ludovico il Moro. And together they studied these geometric beauties. Leonardo was uh, Pacioli's favorite pupil, and Pacioli taught him mathematics and geometry. And so here we see that the Codex is endowed with the great painter's illustrations. All the illustrations are by Leonardo and they're jewels basically of symmetry and crystals of numbers forests of faceted shapes kaleidoscopes of planes as you can see and they are all elements of a symbiosis which the two men the two minds believed existed between the aesthetic quality of architecture and of the human body seen through the eyes of geometry. And speaking of architecture, these many different geometric shapes, especially the circles, can be seen within the interior of a very famous Milanese church called Santa Maria delle Grazie. And the cupola of this church was built by Bramante. So at the time, at the end of the 15th century, these three great men were transforming the Milanese court into a kind of second Athens. Bramante, Leonardo da Vinci and Fra Luca Pacioli. Now, Leonardo, as is widely appreciated, was interested in many, many, many different things. He had many curiosities, and the Ambrosiana Library treasures the largest and most eclectic collection of original drawings, sketches, studies, notes, thoughts doodles and formulas by the universal man himself. This is called the Codex Atlanticus and it's there in the Ambrosiana Library. Now the Codex contains more than a thousand individual folios 
and it embraces Leonardo's life and career. It covers an intellectual um, lifespan of about 40 years from 1478 to 1519, so to the very day of his death. And it expresses everything, this codex, from mathematics to mechanical engineering, from botany to astronomy, from town planning to sonography. And within it, we may see the most curious experiments and projects for the exploration of the depths of the oceans, for the exploration and the scrutiny of the skies. And really no other artist from the Renaissance has left us with such a great heritage, with such an, an enormous cultural legacy. And such an enormous number of manuscripts by which it is po possible really to follow the evolution of his thoughts and his preoccupations. Now these documents have a very checkered history and I'll try to summarize it for you. It all began, in fact, in the year of his death in 1519, when a few days before um, his end, Leonardo uh, was in exile, of course, in Amboise in France, and he bequeathed all of his materials to his favorite pupil, his star pupil, Francesco Melzi. So Francesco Melzi, who came from a, a noble uh, Lombard family, inherited, found himself suddenly with an enormous inheritance. All the notes, all the sketches, all the projects, all the instruments, all the, the remaining paintings uh, that Leonardo left him. And he transfers all of these materials to his villa just outside of Milan, his villa in Vaprio Dadda to be exact. And here he begins to catalog the material, he begins this humongous work. But unfortunately, he dies before he has even begun, as a matter of fact. And when he dies, his heirs, who were quite ignorant of the importance of the material, begin its dispersal. They allow its dispersal. So they begin to sell sheets of parchment uh, indiscriminately. And they begin even to, to use these parchments and these notes as presents. Now, subsequent, subsequently, the sculptor Pompeo Leoni, who was working uh, at the end of the 16th century, he was, well, middle of the 16th century, he was working for the Spaniards in Milan. He was working for the Spanish governors. He managed to buy, to buy back parts of these notes. And he embarked on a campaign to save and to recover as much of the lost material as possible. And indeed, he did manage to recover uh, quite, quite a good deal. Nonetheless, he did something which is today, in our eyes, quite, quite questionable. He started cutting and pasting. And what did he do? He divided all the materials and all the studies which had an anatomical subject matter, a naturalistic subject matter, from all the studies which, to his mind, were more scientific, more technical, and so on. And he created two large volumes. One of these volumes made itself, uh, arrived in Spain, and it eventually found its way to England, and is since named the Windsor Codex. And you may know that the Windsor Codex is full of sketches um, of Leonardo's anatomical drawings. Now, the other volume that Pompeo Leone created and gathered together gathers all the technical and the scientific notes. And I'm showing you some of these examples on the screen right now. And it was referred to as the Codex Atlanticus, so-called because of its large format much like that of an atlas, Atlante, Atlantico. So in the 17th century, the codex was then 
purchased by a Milanese nobleman called the Marquis Galeazzo Arconati, who then donated it to the Ambrosiana in 1637. 1637. So the Codex has been there in the Ambrosiana since 1637. Now, obviously, the story is much more rocambolesque than I'm telling you. It's full of trials, tribulations. Uh, it's full of stories about the Codex being stolen by the Napoleonic troops at the end of the 18th century. And then finally, it makes its way back. But suffice it to say that it's still in the Ambrosiana and that every three months, 20 of these precious folios from the Codex Atlanticus are exhibited on a rotational basis within the wonderful reading room of the Ambrosiana. Now, much has been said about Leonardo's um, dilemmas, about his pentimenti, about his unfinished works and his indecisions, but what of his convictions? Now, the Codex is undeniable proof that Leonardo was profoundly convinced of one fact, and that is that science and art were interrelated. That you could not be a good scientist without drawing directly from nature. That, conversely, you could not be a good artist without taking an interest in science. And his codexes are really the witnesses of a Renaissance man's struggle to separate his work from that of a mere artisan. He contributed greatly to the elevation of the status of the artist. And through his research, his creativity, his studies, he had reached the level, if not uh, gone beyond the level, of culture of the court humanists. Even though he still uh, privately referred to himself as a man without letters, homo senza lettere. You can see these, these notes in the Codex Atlantico. Why? Well, because he had a mild form of dyslexia, it is thought, and it was very difficult for him to learn Latin, which was the language, of course, of the humanists. And so he had this inferiority complex, which, of course, for us is um, unthinkable. However, he was convinced that the art of drawing had a princely role, and that these drawings were the supreme instruments by which the universe could be studied and analyzed. And all of this research and thought is contained within his paintings too, and it's contained in mysterious ways within his paintings. And the Ambrosiana holds and is the proud home of this next piece. This is a haunting example of the kind of ideal portraiture which Leonardo will devise. This portrait is called Portrait of the Musician, simply, and it's the date, we believe, is around 1485. Now, it is not often remembered um, that Leonardo arrives in Milan at the Milanese court in 1482 for the first time in the guise of a musician, really, in the guise of a singer. He had a, a beautiful singing voice, and he had been sent by Lorenzo de' Medici. Uh, he had been sent from Florence with a delegation to entertain the Duke of Milan, Ludovico il Moro. And he was accompanied, Leonardo, by another musician, his good friend Atalante Migliorotti, and together they donated, they presented the Duke with a beautiful lyre with the head of a horse. Now, Leonardo was also a sublime performer of the Lira da Braccio, and he was very fond of creating these very unusual instruments with his own hands, like the famous viola organista. He was fascinated by the vibration of chords and often studied the difference between light waves and sound waves. And it is well known, and this is very important, that he referred to music 
as the painting of the invisible. So this particular portrait is believed to be a personal portrait of Franchino Gaffurio, a very close friend of Leonardo da Vinci. Gaffurio was a choir master of the Duomo and a skilled musician working at the court of Ludovico I. Now, the depiction of his features, the portrait itself, is very different from the typical Milanese portraiture, the portraiture of the time, which was usually in strict profile. And this character, as you can see, is in a three-quarter position. The will to slowly move around, to turn that face towards us is clearly evident. The expression here is very, very intense, as you can see. And the forms are less stylized and not as hieratic compared to, to those of his contemporaries in, in traditional Milanese portraiture. Now, the bodily perception of the sitter and his psychological presence is emphasized by that dark background, as you see just behind the figure, and it pushes the figure to the forefront almost makes them pop out of the frame. So the three dimensions are also expressed by the use of the chiaroscuro, the light and shade, which Leonardo had first seen the Flemish painters using, but which he now develops in the most sophisticated way, in the most sophisticated way possible. And it's an acute analysis, this face, this portrait, this light, of how light, in fact, falls on the surface of the face, as you could possibly imagine. And Leonardo was very interested in physiognomy, and he wanted his portraits to look as real and as individual as possible. His drawings and studies on the various uh, human expressions, emotions are well known and documented within the Ambrosiana, aside from the Codex Atlantico and aside from this painting, which you now see on your screen. The Ambrosiana also holds a series of caricatures by Leonardo. Now, in 1498, Leonardo begins one of many of his treatises, and he begins a treatise on the art of painting. And within it, he stresses the importance of observation and experience, and of being true to nature rather than to a, a canon of beauty established by man. He also believed, and this is another one of his convictions, that in order to paint a good portrait, one must express the stirring of the soul. In Italian, we say, i moti dell'animo. So, a good portrait must express that which we see through the eyes of the musician here. And there is this kind of inner movement. There is something from within. I'm going to try and enlarge this for you. Here you are. And it's something which makes the factual external physiognomy come alive. It's a painting which expresses not only the surface of the skin and bones, but also what goes on behind the eyes, what goes on in, in man's mind. The, the eyes painted by Leonardo here express many movements. It's not just the stirring of the soul, it's the thoughts of the mind, it's the, the flurries of the heart, the fancies of the spirit. And in his conception, in Leonardo's conception, man will be exposed at 360 degrees, weaknesses and strengths alike. And we know this, of course, because this will be further developed in the Last Supper, in all the faces of the 12, 12 apostles, which he paints here in Milan. Now, the scholar, one of the, the most important Italian scholars of Leonardo da Vinci, Carlo Pedretti, notices that in this painting, the pupils of the sitter are dilated to different degrees, 
reflecting the different angles of light from one eye to the other. So the pupil which is more exposed to the light is smaller than the one which is bathed in more shadow. It's very difficult to tell from this image, but one day hopefully you will be able to see it in, in its live version. So it illustrates an acute observation of Leonardo's and therefore that light changes uh, the eye and that the eye takes time to adjust to a new light. Now our own eyes and our own spirit, our own spirits are moved as we walk through the halls of this amazing picture gallery and we experience the space which the Cardinal built in 1618 and which his successors enlarged and further decorated to house the collection, the original collection of Cardinal Federico Borromeo and those collections bequeathed by many noble uh, Milanese families over the centuries. And one such scintillating image is the mosaic which you now see on the, on the right-hand side of your screen, and which recalls the frontispiece of another precious manuscript contained within the library, contained within the Biblioteca Ambrosiana. So you see there is this continuous dialogue between the library, its contents, and the works on display within the gallery. Now, the manuscript in question is Petrarch's very own copy of all the, the most important works of Virgil, the poet. And it's personally annotated. If you look at that sheet in the center, you can see that there are all of these postille, we would say in Italian, all of these personal annotations in the margins. And this is Petrarch annotating his personal copy, this wonderful manuscript. Um, composed in 1325 in Avignon. And it was commissioned by Petrarch himself to a uh, wonderful artist called Simone Martini. And in fact, the frontispiece, which you see on the left-hand side, which of course is mirrored later on in the mosaic in the gallery, the front frontispiece of this 14th century manuscript um, is painted by Simone Martini. And Simone Martini is the author of many large panel pieces, uh, religious triptychs for the churches of Siena. But here he seems to make himself small. He dotes on the particulars, he scales everything down. His, uh, he scales down his world and creates a miniature. Uh, a miniature heaven, really, where the characters of Virgil interact allegorically with this very bucolic landscape. You can see Virgil there sitting underneath one of the three trees in that landscape. He has a laurel wreath on his head, the quill in his hand, and he appears to be inspired. And then we also see this other very curious character who seems to be drawing a curtain, and this is Servio, the commentator of Virgil. And so a curtain is drawn and Servio narrates behind it. He whispers his personal thoughts to one of the protagonists. And Petrarch always kept this piece with him, this book with him, this manuscript always went where Petrarch went. And some of the, the notes, one note in particular, one of his personal notes, is in fact the obituary of his beloved Laura. Um, and so the Virgil belonging to Petrarch contains the obituary of this incredible mysterious woman, Laura, whose beauty inspired more than 300 love sonnets written by Petrarch, of course. Now, Petrarch was supposed to have seen Laura for the very first time 
in uh, the Church of St. Clair in Avignon on the 6th of April, 1327. Now, earlier Italian poets had written splendid love sonnets expressing their desire for a particular woman, but it was Petrarch's poems that gave rise to a whole genera generation of imitators in Europe um, and great authors, indeed, who were influenced by these sonnets, like uh, Spencer, Shakespeare, there are, there are many. Um, within the Ambrosiana, therefore, we have this love story between Petrarch and Laura, but there is another ancient love story to be told within these walls. And it has to do with the next object that you see on your screen. And it's another curious and um, fetish worthy object that you can see in the Ambrosiana. It's this lock of golden hair contained with this wonderful Victorian style monstrance. Now, you see, you must know that amongst all of the knowledge of the Ambrosiana, lies a small packet of letters. The Ambrosiana actually owns the very sweet correspondence between the humanist Pietro Bembo and the Duchess of Ferrara. The Duchess of Ferrara being her most sublime ladyship, Lucretia Borgia. Now, Lord Byron had seen had come to the Ambrosiana on his grand tour, and he had referred to these letters as the prettiest love letters in the world. And the lock of blonde hair was contained within one of these letters. It's a, it's a most sensual relic of Bembo and Lucretia's thwarted love. Now, Byron is also known to have stolen when the librarian wasn't looking, a single thread from the blonde locks of Lucretia. And so he kept this memento with him forever, apparently. He always kept it with him within a book. And when I look at this, I think, what is a lock of hair? What is in or behind a lock of hair such as this? When I look at this, I think of the fertile power that women's hair has had within the imagination of various authors, both sacred and profane, in fact. So I picture Mary Magdalene, and you can see her in the center here, and I picture how she was known to have washed Christ Christ's feet and delicately dried them with her silken locks. A mane which Titian, Tiziano, here imagines as this very luscious and luminous drapery for the nude body of Mary Magdalene. Nude, of course, because here she is depicted renouncing all her riches in penance. This painting, by the way, or a, a beautiful copy of this painting is also on display within the Ambrosiana. But when I think of that lock of hair, I am reminded also of Erminia, which you can see on the left-hand side there, and the dramatic cutting of her hair in order to bind the wounds of Tancredi in Tasso, Torquato Tasso's Jerusalem Delivered. And the hair, of course, will have this beneficial, this profound restorative power. And last but not least, on the right-hand side, we have this illustration by Walter Crane of one of uh, the Brother Grimm's stories. It's Rapunzel, as you can see. And here we have the strength of her long tresses, sweet ropes for a young lover to liberate her with, supposedly. So the lock of hair as a symbol of Lucretia's love is also a timeless relic of sensuality, of femininity, 
uh, of strength, of creativity. And briefly, briefly now, who were, who was Lucretia Borgia? Who was Pietro Bembo? Now, Lucretia was Pope Alexander's, uh, Pope Alexander Borgia's infamous daughter. And she had been depicted throughout the history, throughout the ages, as a woman of extravagant vices. But really, she began her story as a child bride, married to three different husbands in dramatic succession and dramatic homicide as well. She was ruthlessly exploited for political gains, for political advantage by her father and brother. And when the scholar Bembo, the humanist Pietro Bembo, first sets his eyes on her, she had just become the new Duchess of Ferrara. Ferrara was one of the most prestigious courts of Italy, and the cost had been very high for her. It had cost her her beloved second husband, uh, who had been murdered, of course, and she had been separated from her child in order to begin this new life as Alfonso d'Este's new bride. Now the letters at the Ambrosiana are a record therefore of this passionate but very gentle and covert love affair conducted by the two lovers over a period of 16 years. Now there are many portraits of both of these characters for Lucretia grew to be very popular, grew to be resilient, cunning, and grew to be well loved by her people. And Bembo, of course, will have a great literary career, a great scholarly career ahead of him. And uh, he will also hold one of the most prestigious posts in the Vatican. Um, at the beginning of the 16th century, he will be the secretary to the Pope for many years, and he will also evolve into one of the most strenuous supporters of Raffaello. If you remember, we spoke of Raffaello last time. And here is, a, uh, here is one of the sonnets that Bimbo writes about Lucretia's hair. Now, there is also a celebratory medal of Lucretia that you can see on the right-hand side, on the top right-hand side there, um, which was created at the court of Ferrara. And then there is a very modest portrait at the bottom there. I'm only showing you the eyes there. A um, portrait painted by Dosso Dossi, uh, which is believed to be really the only uh, true uh, portrait inspired uh, by the actual likeness of Lucretia Borgia. The most well known of her portraits, of course, is the one I'm showing you in the center. And it is the female sitter there who is painted by Bartolomeo Veneto, and which many people in the past have supposed was a portrait of Lucretia. In reality, this would not have been possible, of course, because this was by far uh, a, a, a scandalous portrait too scandalous for Lucretia. Though the eyes, if you compare the eyes in the portrait in the center to the eyes that I'm showing you at the bottom there, are, they do bear a similarity. Now Lucretia here in the center, the supposed Lucretia, is impersonating the mythological character of Flora. And Flora makes me think of another illustrious Flora, within the precincts of the Ambrosiana. And this particular flora resides within a space called the Peristyle, which you can see there on the, the left-hand side. If you visit the library of the Ambrosiana, one of the velvet black curtains on the right-hand side of the entrance basically shields this wonderful space. So if you push past it, you will find yourself in this very atmospheric antechamber. And this is where Flora is embedded within the pavement of this little colonnaded haven. And this is where, in fact, the tesserae of a late 
fourth century mosaic are kept. And in fact, this mosaic comes from the area of the old Roman baths in Milan. So it's a vestige of the city's ancient and prominent past as capital of the Roman Empire of the West. Not many people know that Milan, in fact, had a great Roman history. The Emperor Maxentius in Milan had built 14,000 square meters of uh, a, a great uh, building which was devoted to the thermal baths. And this lovely little maiden that you see here, I'm just going to enlarge that for you a little bit, comes from what is possibly the tepidarium of these Roman baths. And it was discovered in the 19th century and brought here to the Ambrosiana. And it's possibly the most beautiful fragment of this now lost sumptuous building, the Roman baths. Now, Flora is the most important of uh, the Roman fertility goddesses, and she's especially associated with flowers. Uh, she symbolizes the coming of spring. And it's possible, in fact, that this fragment was just one of four corners of, the, of one of the rooms, the, the tepidarium, perhaps, and that each of the other corners represented one of the other four, re four seasons. And you can see here that the center of the, of the circular shape, the medallion, bears the, the face of Flora, and then that she is encircled by this wonderful guilloche motif, this ornament, this braided ornament, which is so typical of the, the Greek and the Roman world, but which can also be spotted, in fact, in Persian art, and even later in Celtic art. But the golden hair of Lucretia may also be assimilated, in my mind, with the grace and the purity of a character, such as this next piece from the Ambrosiana, which I'm showing you. And this is the beautiful head of a virgin painted by Botticelli. This is also in the original collection of Cardinal Borromeo's collection. Um, now, this is the most, uh, the, the, the modest prima donna of this beautiful painting. And the Madonna comes from this larger piece, as you can see, which is called the Madonna of the Red Pavilion. And it's a very special piece by Botticelli. And when we think of Botticelli, surely one or two of his most uh, famous works comes to mind, like the Primavera or the Birth of Venus. And these are all, if you think about it, prevalently pagan works, pagan iconographies. They're very typical, usually. The work of Botticelli is very typical of Florentine humanism in the 15th century, of the celebrated intellectual circle of Neoplatonic scholars like Marsilio Ficino and like Lorenzo de' Medici himself. However, this piece, though beautiful and enchanting, is very different for many reasons. Now, the style that the painter uses, the, the manner which he has, the subject, above all the subject, makes it very, very different. It is purely religious, as you can see. And it was painted between 1490 and 1495. And it thus expresses the gathering intensity of Botticelli's religious fervor. And in fact, it comes at a time when the artist Botticelli undergoes a kind of spiritual dilemma, a spiritual crisis. What happens is he falls under the spell of Savonarola, the Dominican preacher who had come to Florence preaching a return to, to pauperism, a return to austerity. And he even foresaw a kind of apocalypse upon the, the rule of the, of the Medici. Now, Botticelli was so taken by his words 
that apparently he even threw into the bonfire of the, fa of the vanities many of the remaining pagan works in his workshop. So just think what we might have seen had he not had this crisis. Now, he began to paint around about this time in a slightly more Gothic style. The image that he chooses here is that of the Maria Lactans. If I enlarge this for you, you will see that the Virgin Mary has one breast uncovered and that she is ready to feed the baby Jesus. Now, it was a subject which reflected his newfound piety and it also ties Botticelli to the late international Gothic style of Northern Europe. It's, it's very similar to, uh, it has certain Flemish features. Um, and within Northern Europe and within 14th century Italy, so the Italy of a century prior to this painting, there had been a cult which developed around the breast milk of the Virgin Mary. And the work is full of Marian symbols, in fact, of Marian symbols of all kinds. And the Virgin Mary herself dwells, inhabits a beautiful garden, but it's a divine garden enclosed, as you can see, by a low stone wall. And it's separated from the romantic landscape beyond. So she is privy to nature's abundance and to the sensuality of nature, and yet she is chaste. The birth of her child, of course, being the work of the Holy Spirit, of divine intervention. And this iconography called Ortus Conclusus, Garden Enclosed, uh, is a recurring symbol of the chastity of the Virgin Mary. Uh, another wonderful symbol is at the very forefront of this tondo, and it's there in at the bottom. It's called it's a it's a lily, and I'll just enlarge that for you. There, it's within this amphora, this bronze amphora. There, the lily, the white flower of purity. So the white flower of purity, yes, but the child, as you can see, totters towards the mother's. Uh, full and nurturing breast. He's guided by this angel, while the, the two other angels, as you can see, begin to draw the red curtains of this pavilion as if to reveal this scene uh, before our eyes. So it's sort of, it's almost like a revelation that we're experiencing. And this pavilion, or um, kiborium, you might say, over the head of the Virgin Mary is also a symbol, it's an ancient early Christian symbol for the heavens, in fact. And here the Virgin is queen of her domain. She is queen of the heavens. So it symbolizes this kind of paradise-like dimension. Now, uh, it's difficult to see because the shadow of this beautiful uh, golden frame uh, hides it, but at the very top of the pavilion, we have these golden oranges and leaves of green that decorate the pavilion and they symbolize sin and redemption. Um, and it's a symbol which is often used in Flemish art, in fact. So there is this strange fusion within this piece between the physical and the ethereal. Uh, and this is the Madonna of the Red Pavilion, which attracts many, many vit visitors to the Ambrosiana, and it ensnares them within this kind of suspended moment, which Botticelli manages to craft very artfully. Now, more than any other um, Italian Renaissance master, Botticelli knew about the power of line. He knew what line could accomplish. He was an incredible draftsman and he makes these linear contours and compositions with subtlety and brilliance. And if you let your eyes follow the rivulets of draperies around the limbs of the angels especially, you will 
begin to sense that there is a, ki a kind of soft breeze uh, blowing through the scene, perhaps a divine soft breeze. But then suddenly everything is crystallized. Everything is frozen in time. So Botticelli is a kind of magician of sorts. And just so you can give a face to the magician, a face which I love very much, this is a self-portrait of Botticelli. And he depicts himself, I'm showing you a detail, within the Adoration of the Magi, which he paints for Santa Maria Novella in Florence. But there is yet another Marian symbol to decipher in this beautiful painting. And this is a book of prayers. This is one of the details of the painting. And it's this book which lies on a soft cushion and the soft cushion is sort of perched on this stone ledge. It's a manuscript which we can imagine the Virgin was reading silently before the baby Jesus was brought to her. And this book is a symbol of her wisdom. It's the wisdom which marks the Virgin Mary as a, a kind of Christian version of the goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom and knowledge. And the book brings me back, of course, to the subject of the library. If only momentarily, but for example, the painted pages, uh, it brings me back to these painted pages because the book appears to be a book of hours, which adds a contemporary 15th century note, of course, to the painting. It's, and a book of hours is contained within the wonderful collection of the Ambrosiana. And this is what I'm showing you here. Now, a book of hours was a private devotional uh, manuscript containing prayers for the different canonical, canonical hours of the day. And it was usually richly illuminated, as you can see, and owned by persons of very high rank, especially in Botticelli's time. And as it happens that the, the Ambrosiana cherishes such a piece, and what I'm showing you now is the Borromeo Book of Hours. So it also brings us back, in fact, to Leonardo, for the miniatures that you see here were splendidly executed by Cristoforo de Predis, who was a disciple of Leonardo da Vinci's. In fact, he was also uh, one of his collaborators, and he was the brother of Ambrogio de Predis, the more famous Ambrogio de Predis, who created the Virgin of the Rocks together with Leonardo. Milan was an incredible and important center for miniature uh, illumination, as this wonderful example testifies. And perhaps this book of ours was uh, a wedding present for one of the Borromeo ladies. Uh, and so Borromeo, you recognize this name, of course, because the founder of the Ambrosiana was also called Borromeo, Federico Borromeo. So perhaps this book was owned by one of the ancestors of Federico Borromeo. Now, to my delight, the page that I'm showing you and that I was able to find is connected to the Virgin Mary and to scenes from the lives of the Virgin Mary and is also connected to Cristoforo's own rendition of the marriage of the Virgin, which we touched upon, if you remember, last time when we saw a piece by Raphael. So here on the left-hand side, is a little miniature of that marriage of the Virgin. <coughs> Forgive me. Now, all this talk of the hours of the day and the pages of the book guides my mind towards the theme of transience. Uh, time unfolds and nature and life have their cycles, of course, and it guides my memory to one of the icons of the Ambrosiana Gallery, which will be my parting gift to you today. And this is the marvelous still life by uh, Caravaggio, by a painter whose life and soul 
will be anything but still. And this piece had been in the collection of Federico Borromeo since 1607. And we know that he acquired it that year uh, during one of his trips to Rome. And there's good reason to think that he knew Caravaggio personally, and most likely he knew him through a common friend of theirs, um, Cardinal Del Monte. Now Borromeo will always treasure this basket of fruit by Caravaggio, and he valued it very, very highly. He will always look for a companion piece for this beauty. But he writes in his diary um, that the, the, the canestra, as it is called in Italian, the basket, will forever remain solitary in his collection because he was never able to find something that compared to its beauty. And in, indeed, it is still exhibited alone, this piece in the Ambrosiana. It dominates the particular wall uh, on which it is hung. Nonetheless, when when Federico Borromeo arrives in Rome uh, to purchase La Canestra, Caravaggio had already flown from Rome. He had fled from the city, driven out by the accusations of murder. And we know, in fact, that Caravaggio had a very temperamental character. Yet he could create masterpieces of such divine balance as this one. A uh, bit of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one might say. Now, Caravaggio was a Lombard painter. He had studied in Milan, where the tradition for naturalism had been well documented. And indeed, this is a very accurate, as you can see, and, and realistic rendition of nature. Yet it is incredibly difficult different from that of his contemporaries in Milan. Now, Arcimboldo had painted portrait heads entirely composed of fruit and vegetables, as you can see. Um, and still in Milan, Fede Galizia and Ambrogio Figino had also worked on the topic of still lives, as you can see there. Now, the canestra, however, is different. The fruit is ripe. It is not classically perfect, Caravaggio's flute, fruit. And in showing nature's imperfections and nature's transience, Caravaggio takes, a brand, takes on a brand new theme. So it's an early work, this, by Caravaggio, pertaining to the beginning of his career, where when he first moves to Rome, so I speak of the 1590s, when our hero is working in the workshop of one mannerist painter called Cesare d'Arpino, who will later be at the service of the Pope. Now, when Caravaggio arrives in the bottega of Cesare d'Arpino, he shocks his contemporaries with his unconventional talk. What does he say? He recommends that they stop looking at the great masters of Renaissance art, at the great masters of the Quattrocento, that they stop glorifying the antique models. And this was, of course, taboo at Caravaggio's time, such talk. Caravaggio will say that, in fact, all of these venerable examples are useless. They're useless. Compared to what nature itself can teach, nature is a sufficient master for anyone, he cried. So of course, this is something which will not go down, will not go, go down well with everybody. His particular brand of naturalism will be accepted by some members of the, of the clergy, will infuriate other members of the clergy, but it will certainly produce a whole generation of international painters, all the way down to Rubens, for example. But let's get back to the canvas in question, to the canestra. If you look carefully at the basket, you'll see that it 
juts out from that wooden table. You see that the basket casts a little shadow on the table because it kind of comes forward. It breaks that veil uh, between fact and fiction. It creates a kind of three-dimensionality. It breaks the screen between painting and our very own dimension, our earthly dimension. So it protrudes from that frame. It's also devoid of any other context. It's the only singular still life that Caravaggio has painted. There are no other objects in this painting, um, no other subjects in the piece, just a, an ochre colored wall background there, which reminds me of 17th century, kitchen walls of 17th century um, dining rooms, especially in certain Spanish paintings. So we are forced to position this basket of fruit within our own world, and in fact it is an allegory of life after all. And yet the trompe l'oeil, the illusionistic painting, is so effective that in the early days of its being exhibited in the Ambrosiana, it was exhibited upon a wooden table, leaning against, just leaning against the wall so that the trompe l'oeil effect could be complete. Now the use of lighting here is also very beautiful. It's very direct. It, it comes uh, most probably from a natural source outside of the painting, but it's also very golden, very gentle. Um, it allows us to meditate on each of the varieties of the fruit presented. In fact, there are various symbolisms, of course, to each of the, these, these fruits, like the grapes. Of course, the grapes represent the blood of Christ, represent Christ himself, who said, I am the vine. And the peaches, the peaches we can think back to the philosophy of Pliny and the way he classified peaches among those fruits that could be divided into three different parts. And these parts would then symbolize the three parts of man, the body, the bones, the soul. And then of course we have the apple, we have the apple of the original sin, but there is a wormhole in the apple if you look carefully. And the figs are far too soft. The leaves are crumpled and tarnished in certain, in certain places. There are a few dew drops on these leaves. And so it's a sign that seasons and time still act upon it. So all of these particulars allude to a theme, a very particular theme, which is the theme of vanitas. And in Latin, the word vanitas means emptiness. And so it points to the inevitability of death, to the fluctuating days and hours of all that is natural and earthly. So it's a theme which will gain enormous popularity in religious painting and especially in Dutch and Flemish painting of the 17th century. And in fact, this is not a coincidence for uh, Cardinal Federico Borromeo himself was a supreme and distinguished collector of Flemish painting. And yet, this vanitas, this allegory of life that Caravaggio presents us so beautifully, makes me think back to that golden lock, to Lucretia's golden lock, and how perfect of a relic it actually is. Um, how the body may perish but the memory will last and how our memory in fact could be an antidote for the inev inevitable decay of earthly life and how the keepsake whether it's a golden lock of hair or whether it's a thought expressed could be the thing which trumps or vanquishes Caravaggio's vanitas uh, the Ambrosiana itself is a precious treasure chest of beautiful and curious keepsakes. And I've only shown really uh, a fraction of what is to be seen. And as I walk out of the building now on my own two metaphorical legs and the night 
falls on the piazzas of Milan and the back streets of the city center. I wonder, now that the Milanese have begun to walk very briskly again, far too briskly on its pavement, I wonder whether they remember that they are walking on the old Roman Forum. For in fact, the Ambrosiana and all of the annexed buildings have sprouted from the ground, which was once at the center of Roman life. So you see in this rendering at the bottom, the, le the right hand bottom corner, the temples, the tabernas, the porticos, this was the Roman Forum. And it was it is now cherished beneath the Ambrosiana, parts of it, the remnants of that ancient Roman pavement. So beneath the Ambrosiana is where the story of Milan and the history of Milan is guarded. And just as Leonardo's musician paints the invisible world and the book of hours strikes or seems to strike a repetitive rhythm, in my mind, I'm reminded of Italo Calvino's phrases, particular phrases about the invisible cities and how an invisible landscape is always underneath the visible landscape, how it will always condition the visible landscape. And when I visit the Ambrosiana, I often think about this path that uh, is trodden continuously over and over again through the ages. Time passes, but it sometimes, it somehow always stays. So I've come to the end of this narration and I hope that you have enjoyed it. And I am now open to any questions. First of all, I would like to thank Alessandro once again for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me once again to speak and to share my passions with the Italian Cultural Institute of Toronto. So let me just check if there are any questions at all. I don't know if I can look at the, the Q&A or the chat. Yes, uh, this is a question that regards the uh, musician by Leonardo. Do we know what composition is scripted on the piece that he has in, in his hand? Um, we do not know exactly, and of course there have been many hypotheses. And we do know, however, that it could be related to the Cantum Angelicum of Franchino Gaffurio, because in fact, if you blow up that sheet of, of music, you can see there are fragments of uh, that, those two words, Cantum Angelicum. Um, you can get in, the question was how you, you can get in touch with me for tours. Well, I do have, yes, I do have a, a website, uh, which is called Art in the City. Uh, you can also write to me by email, and it will be my pleasure to show you around. There are uh, wonderful things to see. There is also the chat here. Let me just see if there is anything else that I need to answer. Okay, I think that is, I think that is all. That means that I have done my job and that um, if, if you do have any other questions, of course, I'm, I'm open to them. You can always write to me or write to the uh, Italian Cultural Institute and I will do my best to answer. So thanks again, um, and yes, we do have another uh, session, another uh, and the last third part, uh, a last enchanted museum to talk about, and this will be the Pol di Pizzoli, and it will be on the 26th of June, um, I believe, if I'm, if I'm correct in remembering that date, Alessandro. Yes, Serena, yes, you're correct. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you again for this extremely informative and, and uh, charming lecture. It's really, I'm sure all of our audience are really excited about the possibility to to be again in Milan and to be again uh, in Italy and to visit in the museum uh, again. I've seen one of the questions in the chat was how to reach out to you for a guided tour. So I see someone is already <laughs> planning to visit Milan. And yes, um, yes it was really, <clears throat> really great to have you for this, for this Friday afternoon. And next Friday, again, we're going to mm -hmm. have have uh, Paul Di Pezzoli Museum, which is another gem of the among the, the, the Milanese museum. So yes, absolutely, it's a it's a wonderful uh, collector's haven, and really, it's 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 actually the distinguished home of a nineteenth century Milanese collector. Um, so it's a veritable chamber of wonders, a wunderkammer, um, and so we shall see some some wonderful pieces there as well, and hopefully one day in real life. <laughs> yes, yes, we all hope so. So thank you again, Serena. Thank you to okay. all the attendees, and uh, look forward for meeting you again online on Zoom next Friday, three p.m. for the project. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you once again. To